Uh, Nicodemus, he was a member of the Sanhedrin as well as a Pharisee. And the Sanhedrin was uh, the supreme legal and religious council or court of the Jews during the time of Jesus. It was made up of 70 or 71 uh, people, members, a mix of the high priests, the elders, scribes, Pharisees, and Sadducees. And uh, the acting high priest was the president of the Sanhedrin. Uh, they had civil authority under the Romans. You remember the Romans were in rule, the world rule at this time. But they gave uh, the Sanhedrin uh, authority uh, to have trials and, uh, and uh, for, for uh, civil crimes. However, they were, not, they were not given authority to hand out the death sentence, capital punishment. And you remember that's why Jesus was taken before Pilate after being found guilty by the Sanhedrin because they were seeking the death penalty. Uh, Nicodemus, so he was part of the Sanhedrin. He was also a Pharisee. And the Pharisees were this religious sec sect of Jews uh, that were very detailed in the minute matters of the law of Moses. In fact, they were experts in the Mosaic law, uh, but also in the hundreds of additional laws that were devised to keep people from breaking the law of Moses. In a way, uh, they built a fence around the law. Uh, they made rules to try and keep people from getting close to breaking the law. Uh, and this was nothing new. You may remember God told Adam, don't eat from the fruit of this one tree. Uh, but when asked, Eve told Satan that they were not to eat of it or touch it. And so Adam kind of put a fence around the law. And obviously he added this rule to not even touch the tree. You know, Adam probably said something to the effect, you know, hey, sweetheart, God said we can eat from any tree in the garden except that one in the center. Don't eat from that. In fact, don't even touch it, you know, because if we don't touch it, we can't eat it, right? Uh, well, did it work? No, they touched it and they ate it, right? They grabbed the fruit in their hand. You know, hey, I've already disobeyed this far. Might as well go all the way. And then they ate it. So in the same way, the Pharisees made very detailed rules to follow to keep them from sinning. Uh, and, but the consequence to that was the Pharisees became self-righteous. You know, not only do we follow the laws of Moses, the law of God, but we've one-upped it with our own rules, that we've, and we follow those also. You know, we've gone above and beyond. Not only do we deserve heaven, you know, we deserve more than heaven. We, you know, we exceeded God's requirement. God owes us a special place in heaven because we're so righteous. Well, what does Jesus say about the Pharisees? He says this in Matthew chapter 23, and you can turn there or it'll be up here. He says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Hypocrites means uh, actor, actors. For you, cl you're clean, you clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside they are full of robbery and self-indulgent. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and of the dish so that the outside of it may become clean also. Verse 27, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, actors, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they are full of dead men's bones and uncleanness. So you too outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Jesus says, woe to them, because they were representing God to the people. They were religious but they were missing the whole point of the law, the whole point of serving God. To them, it was religion, a, a competition, a discipline. You know, it was all about me, how good I am at doing this, being religious. It's all about what I can do, my self-control, my willpower. You know, look at me, look at me. When it should be about God, how good God is. Look at what God can do in me. Look at his power. Look at his control in my life. Look at him. Look at him. In John chapter 2, we're told towards the end in verse 24, but Jesus, his part, was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men. And because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew that what was in man. Jesus knew the hearts of the Pharisees. You know, there's no fooling God. He's not fooled by outward appearances. It doesn't matter what anyone else thinks about you. God knows us better than we know ourselves. He knows our hearts. He knew the hearts of the Pharisees, and he knew the heart of Nicodemus. And so that brings us to John chapter 3, starting in verse 1. 
Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Why did Nicodemus come to Jesus at night? Seems to be the question people always ask. Well, he could have been afraid to be seen with Jesus. You know, the Pharisees were all about outward appearances. Or maybe it was just scheduling. You know, they're both very busy. Maybe at night was the only time, you know, he could talk to Jesus alone. Often I find that to be the case in my life. Often I get alone time with Jesus at strange hours and sometimes strange places. You know, it may be the same with you. When do you get alone time with you? A lot of us would say late at night or early in the morning, middle of the night. You know, anyway, the point of it is, the important thing is that he came to Jesus. He came to Jesus and he was seeking the truth. So Nicodemus, he comes to Jesus and he says, Rabbi, teacher, we know you're from God because the signs you do, they prove it. And Jesus responds, hey, you're right. You know, nothing gets by you, Nick. You're a pretty sharp guy. You got a keen eye. I like that. That's right. I'm from God. I'm the teacher. I'll be teaching in the temple all week. You know, pay attention. Maybe you'll learn something. Hey, it's nice meeting you. Be cool. We'll see you later. No, that's not what Jesus said, is it? It's very interesting. Remember, Jesus knows what's in a man's heart. He knows what's in, he knew what is in Nicodemus' heart. He knew what he was there for, not just to comment that he's a teacher. He knew his heart, uh, and something was not sitting right in this heart of Nicodemus. As a Pharisee, he looked really good. Everybody thought he was good. If you asked anybody that knew him, they'd say, oh, if anybody's going to heaven, it's Nicodemus. I mean, he's a Pharisee. Look at him. He's the most religious guy in town. He's going to heaven for sure. But Nicodemus wasn't falling for it. He didn't feel right in his heart. On the inside, he felt different than he looked. He didn't feel like he was so righteous. He knew he wasn't right with God. And he questioned if he really was on the way to heaven. And so Jesus, he didn't fool around with small talk. He gets right to the point. He answers the real question on the heart of Nicodemus, that Nicodemus didn't ask outwardly, but that he knew what what Nicodemus was asking. So in verse 3 it says, Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, he's saying, listen up. I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? You know, Jesus hits the nail on the head, but Nicodemus doesn't get it. He doesn't understand. And why doesn't he understand? Because the Jews, the Pharisees, the world, us, the church, we think in the physical, in the flesh, inside the box of this universe. We think about the things that are made of molecules and atoms. But how does Jesus think? He's thinking about the spiritual, the eternal, the things that are not made of flesh and blood. Jesus was always doing this. He was always taking a physical and he was pointing it to the spiritual. He would use a physical example to share a spiritual truth. And so he continues in verse 5. Jesus answered, truly, truly, listen up, Nicodemus. I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Verse 7, do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. So Jesus is saying, you're born physically from your mother's womb once, but in a similar way, you need to be born of the Spirit. Just like the day you were born physically, you started living in this world, living outside your mother. In in the same way, you must start living in the Spirit. You were alive in the womb, but you didn't breathe or eat, or drink. You were alive, but you weren't living life yet. You were confined in the darkness of the womb. But when you were born, you took that first breath. You you opened your eyes, and light came in, and you started eating, and drinking, and learning, hearing your mother's voice clearly now. 
seeing the light out of the darkness of the womb. In the same way, we are all eternal beings, spiritual beings. We will all either experience eternal life with God or eternal punishment, uh, e eternity away from God, eternal separation from God. So Jesus is saying, to see the kingdom of heaven, to experience eternal life with God, you have to be spiritually born. You have to start living life in the Spirit. Just as you began to live life in this world, you have to begin to live in the Spirit. Breathing in the Spirit, seeing of the Spirit, eating and drinking in the Spirit, being nourished and sustained in the Spirit, learning in the Spirit, coming out of the darkness, hearing your Heavenly Father's voice clearly now, and seeing the light through the eyes of the Spirit. We need to be spiritually born. Jesus, he uses examples we can relate to, being born again, reborn. It's a, it's a change of parental authority. How did we get into the kingdom of man? We were birthed into it. And the same is true for the kingdom of heaven. We need to be birthed into it. Nicodemus, he lacked this new birth. He lacked a new heart, a new life, a, a new spirit. And he knew it. And that is why he was there talking to Jesus. But you see, he needed more than just a rabbi. He needed more than just a teacher. He needed a savior. You know, we can't save ourselves. We can't change ourselves. We cannot become acceptable to God, no matter how righteous we might try to be. You can't make your behavior more acceptable. We can't get mad less or lust less or use drugs less or use alcohol less in order to see the kingdom of God can't do it on our own. We're not capable, and we don't have the resource. You know, Nick, Nicodemus, he was, he was one of the best men that man had to offer, but he knew in his heart that he needed more than the law to see the kingdom of heaven. The law just shows us our sin. It shows us our flesh. It can't change the flesh. The flesh has to die. It has to be annihilated. It, it has to be crucified. And for that flesh to die, we need to have a new life, a new birth, a new beginning. When we're born in the Spirit, we are no longer citizens of this world. God doesn't honor dual citizenship. We, we've been born into a new kingdom. We're now citizens of the kingdom of God. And then we're resident aliens here on earth, like with a green card, until our work visas expire and God extradites us into his kingdom. You know, Jesus compares it to the wind. And the words wind and spirit, they're interchangeable in the Greek. It's the word pneuma, where we get like pneumatics or pneumonia. Spiritual birth, it's like the wind. You can't touch it or handle it or see it. You can see the effects of the wind, right? You can see the leaves blowing, but you can't see the wind. The same goes for the spirit. You can see the effects of the spirit, the fruit of the spirit. Sometimes like at the day of Pentecost, we're in a hurricane or a tornado of the Spirit, we can feel. Other times, He's just a gentle breeze. Sometimes so gentle, we don't even feel Him. But no, make no mistake, the Spirit is there, even when we can't feel it. We need to walk by faith, even without feeling Him, trusting God and His Word, walking by faith. You know, every moment of every day, we're either walking in the flesh or we're walking by the Spirit. We're either working for the kingdom of this world, or, or we're working for the kingdom of God. God's kingdom. That work has eternal value. Work that'll not be burned up in, in the refining fire. It's everlasting, permanent, eternal work. In verse 9, Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? And he's just blown away here. And Jesus answers and said to him, Are you a teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen. And you do not accept our testimony. And Jesus is speaking, we, saying him, the Holy Spirit, God the Father. Verse 12, If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Another name for Jesus. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, 
even so the Son of Man must be lifted up so that whoever believes in Him, so that whoever believes will in Him have eternal life. Jesus is telling him that he needs to look at the spiritual. He needs to be walking in the Spirit, trusting in the Spirit. But Nicodemus, he's still not understanding. And why is that? Well, later Jesus tells us in John chapter 16, verse 12, he says, I have many more things to say to you. He's talking to his disciples, his followers. I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will disclose to you what is to come. Verse 14, he will glorify me, for he will take of mine and will disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore I said, he that takes of mine, he that he takes of mine and will disclose it to you. Why isn't Nicodemus understanding? The same reason the lost don't understand the spiritual, because they don't have the spirit guiding them, speaking to them. You know, guys, don't reject the things you can't grasp right now. So many things we can only receive by the Spirit when He's ready to show us. God is a very complicated being. He's very uh, amazing. And, uh, you know, so sometimes we just have to say, I don't understand it. But God said it, so I believe it. And that's what Nicodemus is going to have to do. He's, he, he's not going to understand because the Spirit had not come yet. But because he knew Jesus was a teacher from God, he could trust what Jesus said, whether he understood it or not. Jesus says, no one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man, him. He's telling Nicodemus, he came down from heaven, and he'll be going back to heaven. In 1 Corinthians 15, 20, we're told, but now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, after those who are Christ's at his coming. He, Jesus, is the first fruit of those that have risen from the dead. Nicodemus says, asks, how can these things be? And then Jesus said, just as the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Jesus is referring to the children of Israel in Numbers chapter 21, starting in verse 4. Remember, they, uh, as we're in Exodus, we haven't gotten this far, but the people have come out of Exodus, out of uh, Egypt. God's leading them through the wilderness to the uh, promised land, and it ends up being a 40-year journey because of the people's um, sin. Uh, they wouldn't listen. And so in verse 4, here's an example of it. It says, Then they set out from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around to the land of Edom. And the people became impatient because of the journey. The people spoke against God and Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this miserable food. They're talking about the manna that God provided from heaven. Then the Lord, verse 6, sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. So the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned because we have spoken against the Lord and you. Intercede with the Lord that he may remove the serpents from us. And Moses interceded for the people. He went to God on their behalf. Verse 8, Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a standard, a staff, a pole. And it shall come about that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, he will live. And Moses made a bronze serpent, he set it on the standard, and it came about that if a serpent bit a man, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. Can you see the parallel here? The people grumbled about God and his provision for them. They were, they're questioning God's direction for them. They were sinning, and God judged them. Remember, the wages of sin is death. They earned death, and they were being bitten, and they were dying. And now all of a sudden, God and Moses didn't seem so bad after all. 
and they confessed their sin to Moses, and they asked if he would intercede for them. And God, in his awesome grace and his mercy, he tells Moses what to do. And he, instruct, he instructed him to make this bronze serpent to be lifted up on this staff. Bronze always deals with judgment in the Bible, and the serpent always deals with Satan. Satan is being judged on this pole. Sin had to be judged. When the people were bitten by the serpents, they're dying. And the only way, the only antidote, was to look upon their sin being judged. It was to look at the staff. The people just looked in faith upon this bronze serpent, upon the judged sin, and they were healed. The consequence of their sin was given to another. There was no trying to figure out another way, you know, like, you know, catching all the snakes and killing them or uh, making some kind of anti-venom for the snakes. There was nothing man could do, no work on his own, except look upon the work of God, accepting the antidote that God provided. Again, Jesus is pointing away from the physical, away from the flesh, away from the works of man to the works of God, God's antidote to God's provision for man's sin. Jesus is telling him, Nicodemus, you can't earn salvation. They couldn't earn it in the wilderness. You can't earn it now. The world today, they, they want people uh, to provide their own way to heaven. People say, you know, hey, I'm a pretty good person. My, my good outweighs the bad on the scale, so I guess I deserve to go to heaven. Or some say, you know, hey, as long as you're true to whatever you believe, as long as you're true to your religious beliefs, it doesn't really matter what the truth is. It doesn't matter if you're not worshiping the true and living God. Well, it might not matter to them, but it matters to God. Did it matter which staff they looked at to get the antidote? Oh, yeah. It was the one that God provided. The only requirement to be saved from the serpent was to look in faith at the staff that God provided through Moses. Just like our only requirement to be saved for all eternity is by looking in faith to Jesus on the cross, God's antidote for sin, God's judgment for sin. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witness surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Verse 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus. How are we going to lay aside every encumbrance? How are we going to lay aside the sin that so easily entangles us? Fixing our eyes on Jesus. Fixing our eyes, focusing, concentrating, full attention on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. He's saying, think about what Jesus went through on your behalf so you don't lose heart. Why did Jesus have to suffer on the cross? So that if we believe, we will have eternal life in him, in Jesus. Eternal life doesn't start when this flesh dies. Eternal life starts when we're spiritually born, when we're born again. If you've been born again, you're already living eternal life. Your, your, your eternal life has already started, and you should be living for his kingdom. You know, patriotism, it's defined as devoted love, support, and defense of one's country, uh, national loyalty. Are you a citizen of America or a citizen of the kingdom of God? Which one are you more concerned about? Which one do you pray more about? Does, does, does God offer citizenship to individuals? Or does he annex whole people groups into his kingdom because they perform righteous work? It's just individual. Verse 15 of John chapter 3 says, So that whoever believes, whoever believes, will in him, in Jesus, have eternal life. Why did Jesus have to be lifted up on the cross? So that we would have eternal life. So that we would be born as citizens into God's kingdom, the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is where God rules and reigns. It's not just heaven. Heaven is God's kingdom, but he has extended his kingdom to earth. I'm not talking about rulers of different countries. 
I'm talking about God's spiritual kingdom here on this earth. Us, the church. God is ruling and reigning over His kingdom through us on this earth. And why is that? What's the purpose? God is using us to grow His kingdom, to make disciples, to help bring others into His kingdom, into eternal life, into His church. And when I say church, all believers collectively are the church, according to the Bible. And so what happens when, when one is brought into God's kingdom? He's removed from the other kingdom, the competing kingdom that God has allowed on this earth, the kingdom of the enemy. Because of that original sin by Adam, we're all born into the enemy's kingdom with our deceitful, selfish hearts, seeking after our own pleasures, our own wants, our own desires. We're all part of this kingdom, this kingdom of lies, of death, of destruction, a kingdom that will end in judgment. It'll be judged by the perfectly just God. Why did God have to sacrifice himself on the cross? Why did it have to be him? It seems uh, so extravagant, so extreme. You know, why, why did he have to offer so much? Because God is perfect in his justice. He can't just sweep sin under the rug. Because there's a consequence to sin, and that consequence has to come to fruition. It has to be completed. And if it's not completed by the perpetrator, by us, it has to be completed by one higher, and that's by God himself. What could possibly motivate God, the creator of the whole universe? What could possibly motivate Him to suffer the consequences of our sin? And our sin against Him, no less. You know, our sin is rebellion and disobedience to God Himself. What could possibly motivate God to do that? Verse 16 says, For God so loved the world. For God so loved the world, us, you and me. For God so loved you. That's God's motivation. It's love. And what is love according to God? Well, he defines love for us in 1 Corinthians 13. Starting in verse 4, he says, Love is patient. Love is kind and not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant, does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It's not provoked. does not take into account a wrong suffered. Did you hear that? For God so loved the world, and he says, love does not take into account a wrong suffered. God does not take into account a wrong suffered. Verse 6, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. That's why God came through Jesus. John 3, 16 again, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. He who believes in Him, in Jesus, is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is either by far the best news you've ever heard in your life, or it's by far the worst news you've ever heard. There's no in-between. You either believe or you don't. You know, when bitten by the vipers, they either believed God and they looked upon His provision, upon God's way of salvation, this, this serpent on the staff, and they lived. Or they didn't believe and they refused to look and they died. He who does not believe has been judged already. When they refused to look, they were dead already. It was just a matter of time. There's no in-between. There's no halfway. It's either life or death. Do you see what he is saying? Jesus, he came to save the world, but if you refuse his way of salvation, by default, you're choosing judgment. You know, if you're drowning in the middle of the ocean and there's one boat, with one life preserver thrown out to you, 
and you refuse to grab a hold of that life preserver, you are choosing to drown. By not choosing life, you're choosing death. There's no in-between. There's no, hey, waiting to see what happens. We know what happens. If you're in the ocean, it's just a matter of time before your lungs fill with water and your body dies. By refusing the life preserver, the way of salvation, you're dead already. By not taking the way of salvation, you choose death. You know, some say, well, hey, all roads lead to heaven. You know, all paths end up, they end up in the same place. You know, as long as true to your, you're true to whatever you believe. Yeah, right. You, you know what that's saying? So God became a man and he suffered the most agonizing death possible from the hands of sinners just to provide one more way. You know, there's already so many ways to be, be saved, but hey, why not just add another way? So God says, hey, I'm not doing anything anyway. Might as well go down to earth and let my creation treat me like the most heinous criminal they've ever encountered. Sounds like fun. Hey, what the hey? It'll just add one more road to the thousands that already lead to heaven. That's ridiculous. You know, I don't think so. What they're saying is that the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, of God in the flesh, the Creator, was made in vain. It was worthless. Oh, it's just one more way. It's more like just one more lie of the enemy. You know, hey, just keep treading water. You're not drowning. You know, the other boats are coming. There'll be other life preservers. Just keep treading water. The other ways are coming. He loves to say that. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, he speaks of Jesus in Acts chapter 4, verse 12. And he says, And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. God is saying to every person alive, you either let me suffer the consequence for your sin, the consequence for your rebellion, or you refuse my provision, you rebel even against that, you rebel even against my way of salvation for you, and by doing so, you will suffer the consequence of your own sin. God says, it's either me or you, one or the other. The suffering I endured on the cross or the suffering you will endure for yourself. It's one or the other. What's it going to be? I mean, what an offer, right? What an offer. If you have not accepted that offer, if you've not yet looked upon Jesus on the cross in belief, like the Israelites who resolved that, that, that they were dead, you know, there's no other way out of this. They, they went to God through Moses, and God provided a way of salvation, and God instructed them to look upon the judgment of their own sin to be saved from the snake venom that was coursing through their veins. If you've come to that same conclusion this morning, if you resolve that, hey, I'm spiritually dead, if you've come to that realization that there's no other way out, but there is no salvation in, in no one else, just as God has told us in His Word, but in Jesus. That there is no other name under heaven and earth that has been given among men by which we must be saved. If that's you and you're ready to look upon your sin being judged through Jesus on the cross, then look right here. This unleavened bread, you know, leaven in the Bible, yeast, it represents sin. This bread without leaven has been broken into pieces. And it, and it represents the sinless body of Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, that was broken for you. The juice, it represents the blood, the life that was poured out of his body so that your sins could be forgiven and my sins. If you're not a believer in Jesus, and when I say believer, I'm not saying believing that you believe the fact that Jesus walked on this earth 2,000 years ago. What I'm saying is not believing that Jesus is God's one and only provision for your salvation. If you don't believe that, then you probably don't want to take partake of these elements anyway. So don't bother. Maybe you weren't a believer. But, but God opened your eyes to the truth this morning, you know, you're, and you're ready to be reborn into God's kingdom. 
You don't understand it all, like Nicodemus? It might sound crazy. But you believe it anyway. You believe God's word. And you're ready to start living for all eternity. If that's you, I'm going to be sitting right down here in this front row. Lynn's going to be sitting over here in this front row. If that's you this morning, in just a minute, when the, when the band is playing, I want you to come and sit down right next to us. Either side or both sides. And we'll pray for you. And we'll take the, the communion elements together. If you're already a believer in God's one and only way of salvation through Jesus Christ, take a moment and tell Him thank you. And then come and get the elements when you're ready and take them on your own or take them together with someone else. Okay, so here's the plan. We're going to pray, and the worship team, they're going to come forward, and they're going to play. And Lynn and I will be sitting up here in the front row waiting for you. Whether you want to give your life to Christ this morning, be born again, or if you just want to pray, maybe you just need to get a weight off of your chest, you know. We would love to pray with you. We'll be here waiting for you. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for providing a way and for using these examples, Lord, that we can understand and relate to. And Father, I just ask, uh, if there's any here this morning that have never looked upon your way of salvation in belief, Lord, but just believing that you did it, just as your, your people, your Israelites, looked upon that snake on the staff and, and they believed and their bodies were healed, Lord, as we look upon your uh, provision, your, you in the flesh, on the cross, dying for us, taking the punishment of our sin, the judgment of our sin, Lord, I just ask that you would instill that in us, that, that you would give us understanding of that knowledge, Lord. And Lord, if we've never done that, I just ask that you would stir our hearts right now, Lord, that you would give us courage. Lord, I know this is difficult for us to come to you, but Lord, I ask for that courage. Lord, for those that already have believed, Lord, I just ask for strength, for direction, Lord, uh, for forgiveness of where we failed you this week, where we've dropped the ball. Uh, Lord, we, we know we're not perfect. We know you look at us as perfect, but we know we still have this sinful body and we're struggling, Lord. And so I ask for forgiveness. Lord, and we, of course, we thank you for being our God.